No, 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 no. It looks like there is there is a um, a loop on the belt, a leather loop that is like well. So yeah, I could. Uh, the coin I purse itself, pauses. but it's been cut. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I could definitely see why uh, Critical Role is basically the gold standard when it comes to D and D uh, live streams. They go one. It helps out a lot that all of these guys here are professional voice actors, so there are already some pretty good speakers. And it isn't like us. Uh, Joe Schmoes and Average Joes, or, uh, um, um, yeah, um, I'm gonna, my character, uh, he's gonna, um, uh, 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 uh do, uh, you know, he just, you know, basically speech impediments and having, uh, having the things we want to say log jammed up in our mouths, we can't get them out properly, and, you know, we just, you know, you know, lots of hemming and hawing and whatnot, whereas these guys are, these guys are pretty much smooth as silk as far as the, uh, as far as the talking goes, but like I said, probably one of the biggest reasons why uh, Critical Role is so damn popular is because these guys uh, basically they speak well for a living. I mean, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure the fact that they can do all kinds of different voices and whatnot probably factors in there. But I think one of the requirements for uh, for being a voice actor is just you got to be a good speaker. So, but that's what I'm seeing a lot of here. And then um, I'm also guessing too, a lot of these voice actors, they they probably come in contact to each other outside of the game. You know, they probably, you know, they probably work together on cartoon shows and whatnot. So they already know each other pretty well, and they can already interact with each other pretty well because they have a background in doing this kind of thing in their uh, voice acting jobs. You know, so they know each other pretty well, whereas I'm pretty sure in a lot of these other D&D sessions, a lot of times the relationship probably gets adversarial, or a lot of times when they play the people on a and d table, they're all strangers to each other. You know, they're probably getting out of each other's bad sides and stuff, you know, just, you know, totally unintentional, on accident. So, but they don't, uh, all the other D and D tables, they don't mesh together as well. So, whereas uh, these guys do. And then, um, secondly, another thing I was thinking about too. Um, as far as I, from what I understand, these guys got their start on Geek and Sundry. Um, so I think they started doing this in like 2015. So it. So they they had gotten their start like in the way back when. I mean, they didn't. Yeah. They didn't start when um, Geek and Sundry started, which was like early 2010s, 2012, I want to say. I mean, they didn't start back then, but they did get a pretty early start. I think. Now that I think about it, I think they started right around the time Fifth Edition first came out. Which is which is pretty much the most. The most popular edition of Dungeons and Dragons, Fifth Edition. So, they started right around when uh when uh, Fifth Edition started. So, and then it also helps that I didn't I didn't know about this until some time later. But the uh, the DM Matthew Mercer, he's been playing D and D ever since high school. So he's got a pretty strong background in this. I think uh. Also, if I understand correctly, um, the guy in the upper left corner, Travis Willingham, I think he was the same way too. I don't. He didn't start D and D at the same time Matt did, but he did start pretty far back. So you got two guys here that have a pretty strong background in D and D, so they already know what they're doing. Again, it's probably going to be totally different from most other uh, D and D tables where everybody on everybody on that table can be fairly new. You know, even the DM, even the DM's kind of new at it. You know, so. And I believe there is a, another, another concept that gets tossed around a lot is uh the Matt Mercer effect. Although, although I don't, you, on one end, yeah, that's that's true, because like like I said uh, a few minutes ago, Matt Mercer is pretty much the gold standard. 
So it kind of creates like super high expectations. Like uh, like when a girl goes and gets a boob job and all of the men are <laughs> staring at her, all the other women get jealous about it or think that uh, because all the men are following this girl with the fake tits, they think that the girls now think they have to go and get boob jobs themselves, you know, just so they can have some of the men looking at them too. So it just creates, un you know, unrealistic expectations. And, um, and then anorex uh, anorexia, bulimia, you know, they see the hot mod the hot skinny has supermodel on TV, you know, super popular. No, all the, no, that just basically trigger causes a lot of, uh, causes a lot of women to become bulimic, anorexic, etc. Because, again, the unreasonable expectations. So, uh, technically, the Matt Mercer effect is an effect, but you could apply the, the all kinds of other things in life, not just Matt Mercer himself. So. I think there was something else I was wanting to say about that too. Can't remember what. But but again, kind of a kind of a quickie recap. I could definitely get the, I could definitely get the appeal of critical role. So they're kind of I want to say they are to the live stream D and D universe that the New England Patriots are to the NFL. They're basically the creme de la creme. 